been solved by my technical skills. <laughs> uh, and it's a very, very great pleasure uh, to welcome today Tassif Dean and Marina Warner to discuss the installation in Turbine Hall by Tassita uh, entitled Film. I fear that many students won't yet have seen it uh, since it only opened yesterday. Um, and I was able to be there for about an hour. And let me assure you, it's an extremely moving, important, complex uh, work, um, which I think will establish itself also as a very kind of urgent and pressing work. But let me introduce Tassida, the uh, artist of the installation, and who will all be known to you, as will Marina Warner, uh, the writer, novelist, and art critic. Um, so uh, without more ado, I'll let Marina uh, introduce <laughs> a few remarks and pose some questions, and then we can open it uh, out to the floor. How long, would, maybe it's useful to set up. Yes, yeah, so put five minutes? <laughs> 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 All right, how long should we? Oh, I don't know. Until, until I fall off the chair. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm actually going to stand up because there are so many of you. And I think it's probably easier to hear. You, we, you don't need to stand up. It's just that. <laughs> um, but it's a, it's a, it's a great, great honor. I mean, I'm, and I'm a little bit daunted, um, not least because I'm very tired and I only went to see it last night. <laughs> and so um, the fact that Tasta is here the day after her great opening um, is really very remarkable. The, um, I, th I think that one of the great dangers, as I'm sure many of you will appreciate, about contemporary art is actually suffocating it in words. So that's one of the things I just don't want to do. Uh, so Katastra and I will have, a, I hope, a sort of glancing conversation. But I did want to just say two, um, one or two things to introduce film, her great piece for the Turbine Hall. Um, it's, it's a work of art in itself that actually transforms the east wall of the Turbine Hall as it were as an east window of a cathedral, catching some of the architectural um, reverberations of Giles Gilbert Scott's original architectural practice in a very interesting way. Um, and continuing a theme in Tasta's work of a kind of intersection between secularity and what one might call the numinous. So um, that's, um, and then, but it's not only, but she's not only done that, because it's actually, this is probably, I think, the first time that one of her works is actually part of a campaign, part of a cause that is enunciated rather than um, just implicit in her practice. Because go, accompanying the, um, it's a twofold work, really, because accompanying the monumental visual piece is this uh, creation, which is a really very beautiful book and a tremendous achievement on, on Tasta's part and all the people at Tate who worked with her on it, um, which takes up the issue of analog, which is definitely what, you know, one of the things that we'll talk about um, together. And then I, it, it, in some ways, the both are sort of unexpected departures because they're much more consciously discursive in some ways than um, Tasta's earlier pieces. But they follow this extraordinary year that you've had, um, in which you had a major, major um, exhibition in Vienna. Some of you may have had the good luck to see it in Mumok. And that produced another, uh, I mean, that <laughs> collection of visual works also produced another major uh, book work, which is this exquisite box set called Seven Books Grey. And, um, with a complete filmography and a complete uh, collected write selected writings, collected criticism of Tacita and so forth. So it's, um, it really has been an annus mirabilis. And for our footage. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Tacita very, very uh, generously involved me in a, a col collaboration with them um, in a, one of these little books, which is called Footage. So the first thing I'm going to, well, I'm going to sit down. <laughs> um, and so the first thing I really, I wanted to ask you about the title. Okay. <laughs> I thought you were going to, yes. this seems so loud. 
Um, <coughs> the title, it was strange because um, what happened is that quite early on I had a meeting about the whole, with Tate Publishing. And um, I suddenly, in that moment, um, when we were sitting there, I suddenly, and it, the point is about this year has been a very pivotal year in terms of also the obsolescence of, the rapid obsolescence of film. So when I had this show in Mumuk, I'd made three new films, one of them um, on uh, Edwin Parker on Site Twombly and Manhattan Mouse Museum on Klaus Oldenburg and GDGDA on Julie Meritu. So there were three new films and, that, and I had to, uh, in, in, in terms of getting them to the final stage in the lab, was that the day in Heath, when I arrived at Heathrow Airport was the day that they told me that the Soho Film Lab was um, being taken over by Deluxe and they were stopping the printing of 16 millimeter film, which was, mm -hmm. is cataclysmic for someone like me because I, I, I show all my films as print, as 16 millimeter mm. films in galleries. And I also cut, you know, I create the work by using the print, by cutting the print. And um, so I don't know, many of you probably would know that we, I wrote an article for The Guardian and, and that in turn created a, an online petition, um, which of course made absolutely no impact on Mr. Perlman of Deluxe, but mm. <coughs> it began a sort of, in a way, um, began the process of the project for the turbine. Um, although I didn't know that at the time. It was, um, so in terms of the title, what happened is that when I was quite early on in the project, uh, the, about this point, because um, I could only really start it in, in March after Mumuk, I suddenly, when we were first discussing, discussing the fact that the, the P Turbine Hall project has a publication, and I sat there and I, and I we were in discussion, literally I just suddenly thought, we have to write it, we have to make it about why people want to keep analog. And I don't know, it was one of those things ag and that I said out of that moment. And, and so down the line, I was trying to think, and I, uh, for a long time I should explain, I had absolutely no idea what I was going to do for the turbine hall, which was a particularly painful passage of this year, was not knowing what to do. And um, so I, I, all I knew was that I was doing this publication, and I was trying to think of a, a title that would somehow cover, you know, because I was thinking, what why could I call it a manifesto or whatever like that? And then eventually I just suddenly thought, film, film can cover both things. And then, the, so the title preceded the work, although in a way the content was already just gestating in a way. So, But it fits very well with a lot of the sort of metaphorical resonances. It's not just the actual technical stock that you're talking about and the mm. medium, but there's, all, there's so many aspects of the way you use the medium that are part of your, your kind of vision, and that is that it's both light, it's, it's a kind of li it's light, it's drawing in light, a phrase that you've used of your own work. And it's, um, <coughs> its immateriality is actually enfleshed. It, I mean, it's strangely both a kind of transparent spirit medium and a, a an enfleshed medium in this celluloid. And that seems to me you know, very close to a lot of your contemplation of different states of, of, of being and existence. So, um, but I looked it up in the dictionary because I thought, where does it come from, this word? What is it, this word? And you won't, I think, unless you've done it, also looked it up in the dictionary, you won't believe it. It's a, it means membrane or call, or even the prepuce, the um, <laughs> membrane <laughs> over the penis, <laughs> and, um, originally, or the skin of an egg. And, and, and in Old English. Yeah. And, um, and it seems to me that, you know, the, that one of the things that you do in, in film, in your visual film, is, um, not the book so much, is, is look at the different textures of this kind of, of membrane. Because you have bubbles, and I don't know if you want to talk more about that. The, the way the textural, the textural um, um, surface of the world mm. is, is caught in your film. I mean, just on a, in, when you say the word flesh, it's interesting that at least two of the contributors <coughs> really make the connection between film and human skin. Um, uh, Paolo Cercio's eye wrote, I mean, you know, I don't want my, you know, I don't want my lover to be pure. I want it to be scratched and bruised. And, you know, it's very beautiful what he wrote. And then mm -hmm. Chrissy Isles was the other one. They both made the same, mm. you know, analogy. And, uh, and of course, he actually talks about it being uh, you know, made of gelatine. It's yes. actually made of bones. It's, it is actually made of... Oh, really? Yeah. 
of, of animals. Yes, I, as I only got the book yesterday. I couldn't read it in all, all, all of it before today. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that, that's reinforced Marina's point uh, in the image that, that actually you, you photograph and include in the film. I can't remember now what the, type, the, the name is, this sprocket or whatever at the side. Of the mm, mm. Uh, well, that is, I mean, I don't, it is sprocket. Oh. I mean, in German, sprocket you know, in Europe sprocket they say holes. perforations, but we say sprockets or sprocket holes. And actually, um, technically, that's the miracle of this f project that nobody quite gets their head around. <laughs> <laughs> is the is the it's involving an, a very old, basic kind of cinema film technique, which is like stenciling on the emulsion. It's very mm. you know, but. Mm it never really worked that well um, when it was first done because it was always, it's all to do with how far the stencil, as it were, in this, in technically an aperture gate or the masking is to the film emulsion. And, you know, you need to be extremely, you know, millimetres are critical. And it was always put in the filter gate. Suddenly get loud, I don't like it. Um, you know, which is when you used to always see the sort of you know, the binoculars in early film mm. or, or any sort of, like, somebody thinking of someone well, else and you get a, yes. And the iris things. opening. Yes, exactly. Yeah, the eye but of the camera. It was always very soft. It was never mm. very sharp. Mm. And when I proposed that I wanted to put sprocket holes through masking onto uh, the film, mm. I was met with 100% certainty that it was impossible. Really? And... Um, because it's so fine. Mm. And what you have to understand about this film is that it's, um, <coughs> wake up, <laughs> is that it's, um, it's uh, anamorphic film. So everything mm. is squashed into the film frame in its heart. So the, f the actual aperture gate is actually, has b double information squashed into, into it. So it's, it's even smaller. Yeah. And um, every if you actually look, because everybody in this book Oops. gets a, a strip of film. Um, yes, it's in the. If it's it's still in, in here. Yes, it is. Yes, it's, it's with your. Okay, I mean, I chopped up the film so everyone could have ten frames of the film in the book. And the reason I did this is one, so people could actually physically yes. handle film. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry if I'm putting my fingers on it. Well, it's good. <laughs> and also Signature. because Signature. you could see <laughs> that the sprockets are part of the image. They are part of the image. And the point about, people look at them and they think that, oh, it's film, there are sprockets, of course. They don't imagine that they're actually part of the image. Mm. But they also create shadows behind the sprockets. Yes, but that was just a, a one of those that's, that's magical things. That's because it that really happened. makes them... Different. I know, it was, I mean, it's I was just sort of so lucky. I had no they idea. They become material. But... Um, <laughs> We actually did it with uh, Barco yeah. Leibinger, the architects, and uh, Regina is here, and Michael Bowling, who's one of their architects. And he, we actually did it with a, a state-of-the-art mm. digital technology. So in a way, we, you know, we made, he, he redrew the, the old Ari aperture mask mm. and recreated it. And then he did it through just three-dimensional photocopying, mm. like 3D printing, which is, of course, quite a very, very recent digital technology. Mm. Um, so only now, right now, in this sort of 2011, is it possible to combine the origins of film, mm. you know, or, or in, you know, with this sort of digital technology. So in, it, it is something that couldn't have happened then. Mm. But I mean, now I can go back to that very, very beautiful technique. And the whole film is done with masking. So you could, um, so it was all done inside the camera, and. Um, this is so it's of course completely blind. I mean, you had I had no idea what was possible or was not. But I basically the whole there are we, there are basically eight parts on that east wall. Yeah. You know the crane, the two sides, the two windows, top and bottom, and the three bottom ones. And once I divided that into eight parts, um, I made eight different separate masks. And the the shot that m nearly everyone has, not quite everybody in the book, but everyone does have you know mostly has this colored when every part is colored separately mm. and this piece of film would have gone through the camera 10 times mm. everyone's piece of film goes through the camera 10 times which is a, a labor of such intensity and love and was done with such enthusiasm by this kind of youngish crew who had just kind of got it mm. so 
because you mask, you, you know, you expose first the holes of the sprocket and then you rewind in the mm. camera, making sure, you know, that because of course there, I might have lost you by now, but there are <laughs> four perforations, four real perforations, four real sprockets on every film frame. So you have to make sure that, you know, that it always goes back to the right mm. perforation mm. because otherwise it will... Um, Go out of... Well, it goes out of thing, and then it just, just, I know this is probably but you getting see, right. listening to you talking about it with this, showing the absorption you've had, this sort of, you know, this work of kind of, you know, meditative um, ascasis, you know, real sort of discipline of the concentrated mind, um, makes me, you know, realize that in a lot of your work, you're kind of solidifying time, you know, time, this fugitive thing that we can't ever re-inhabit. Film is actually one of the ways that it can be, I mean, the, you know, some people say captured, but in some senses, you know, it's actually yeah. it's being sort of, you, you know, you used in one of your pieces, you used the word molding. And, and I thought that's so interesting because one wouldn't think of it as actually molding. But that's what happens. Time is kind of in your hands being molded. Well, I mean, when I, um, can I turn this down a bit? I just feel like I just can hear myself like one of those mobile phone conversations. Maybe um, if you put it lower. Uh, maybe. Can you put it lower? But I wanted to... <laughs> it's really loud. Is it, have you turned it down? Oh, okay, that's good. But I wanted to ask you about the other sort of aspect of, um, of film, that, um, which is this, this analogue, this idea of the analogue. Because again, I think the, the metaphorical range um, <coughs> goes off into another sphere. Um, and that is that um, here we are in a sort of idea that this is... This is an authentic uh, fingerprint. This is actually a, a relationship, a kind of, 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 of truth. And it can be extended not only from the light that's enfleshed into the film, but into other areas. And because in your exhibition Analog, the, and the essay Analog that you wrote for that exhibition, you actually talked you know, before about your feeling about this, and, I, and, I, and you, it, you feel it acoustically, and you feel it visually, and so it, do say a bit more about that. I wanted to just go back to your comment about time, though, because for me, um, yeah, for me, this is one of the critical things that is different from about film and and digital medium. Um, am I having a stroke? <laughs> 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 Oh, this is <laughs> I tell you, my dream life and my real life are so close right now. I barely know when I'm awake and when I'm asleep. What time do you have to get to the AFA? <laughs> um, time is, for me, this is one of the critical things about the difference. And... Uh, Time is implicit in the medium of, f of film, and I think when you talk about my films as moulding time, I mean, I, I think it's very uh, akin to the medium, actually, um, which is why it's, it's so um, immensely painful to me to think that mm. I'm going to lose it. Mm. But, but actually, the, your um, earlier films sort of kept the duration was very important. I mean, Craneway event, the duration of the, the unfolding of the event. Um, film is, it was a, there was well, a film kind of is, I mean, film is so different from anything I've ever had to do before, and I didn't have, mm. and, and um, I knew that, I knew I had to do all the things, like, it had to be spectacular. Yes. Actually, despite everyone saying, at least we're not going to get a spectacular work, because you're quiet artist. Mm. But I didn't, I knew that that wasn't the case, it had to be spectacular. And I, you know, it had to be short. Mm. You know, I knew that these things, and, um, the point about it is normally when I cut m my films, and I'm a very, very formal editor, oh. I'm guided by the narrative of time. And um, when I first began to cut this footage, which was very disparate, it's, it is more like collage, montage, whatever you want to say. It's, it's not like anything I had. I, I suffered terribly about not having anything to guide, no time to guide me. Mm. So um, it took me a very, very long time to actually work out how to do it and how I did it was to use it was to make it more like a, a you know a poem in a way to give it meter yes. and rhythm and and how I did that was to use all the, f the flash frames all the you know the end of the roll mm. you know when it
and it got mm, bleached yes. out and yes, all the mistakes of film yes. and, that, and just to puncture it because mm. you can't, I realized and I understood, I actually realized I had a, my respect for, you know, expanded cinema, av avant-garde, you know, experimental cinema, fin filmmakers just went shooting up because it's actually much more difficult mm. than I ever realized to make these very kind of, you know, films without narrative, I mean, strictly without narrative, mm. without the narrative of time. Mm. Okay. <laughs> do you want to ask about? Do you want to um, uh, respond about an analog as the idea of it being f beyond the idea of film? That the uh, this idea of of a kind of platonic, almost platonic truth. <coughs> and I just I'll just expand on it. I mean, in, in, in this, this, this um, show you what, what I'm what I mean. Um, in many of your earlier pieces, we hear the sound of the machine um, because you want us to know what's happening in the real world as well as the represented world. I mean, so the w the, there's a kind of the, the analogies or the analog situation is, is existing both in the art that we he see and hear, but also in the machinery that's m the technical machinery that's making it happen. And that kind of truth to materials is a sort of truth to the technology. So. Well, uh, the analog, the the, um, the equivalent. Yes. You know, I f I it's actually a word that I struggle to really define. Mm. In, and um, especially when I first wrote that text for. Yes, well, that's. Yeah, actually, I do. I do. Yeah, because then you can use it so you know. It's just weird. It was like it was in my ear. Yes. Um, I, I mean... I I you might have to turn the other one off because we'll get feedback. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Do you want to... Is that off now? Yes, Sorry. Um, no, I'm just talking about the definition of analogue. Is that all right at the back? Yeah. yeah. Good. Better. Okay. okay. Um, the definition of analog is something that actually I, I kind of struggle to completely define. I know it's it's not, it's not t technically it's an equivalent. It's not technically technically transcription or um, you know people always think that digital now is the analog of analog, which is of course completely not the truth. No. But that's what they are now replacing oh, I see, no. in in terms of replacement. Yes. You know, I, I mean that's what the whole yeah. thing is about. Yes. It's, e it's probably easier if you say what it isn't. I mean, it, it, you know, it's because basically digital is coded. You, you break it down into, you know, bits. Oh yeah, I, know, I mean, yeah. I understand that. I mean, I'm, what I mean is in terms of mm. um, the, re the replacement of, you mm. know, that yes. it, it can, there's no difference, which is the, you know, and what the whole argument of this work and this book is that, of course, they're entirely different and separate mediums and need to be treated as such. But for some reason, well, that with the particularly with in digital and analog, is the assumption that a digital film, a, you know, digitalization of a film can replace it, which you would never do with a you know, you'd never do with a painting or yes. a sculpture or any other, any other physical yes. you know, medium. Well, well, one of the areas that um, it's happened without anybody um, defending it, um, unlike you leaping to the defense of um, analog 16 millimeter and 35 millimeter, is of course in our transparencies. All of us, you know, used to use transparencies for our lectures, and they've just been discontinued without anybody. And the, the, the quality of digital JPEGs can be good if the resolution is high, but uh, the resolution high, when that's high, causes tremendous problems of logjam in computers. So, and very, very difficult. Much less easy to handle. Don't you agree, Mark? Mm. I mean, have you, haven't you well, got I a think, tremendous? I, think it's, I mean, I think it's difficult because, in a sense. I mean, I agree absolutely about transparency, digital. But then, you know, in a previous generation, when I was at the Warburg, uh, there was a discussion as to whether or not the photographic collection should go on to colour slides. Yes. And the kind of eternally eccentric Otto Kurt said, no, it should stay on black and white yes. photographs. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And someone said, but Otto, you know, the whole of Western art is in colour. <laughs> and he said, yes. That's always been a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> well, of course, we managed to change. We managed to change Greek art to make it monochrome. <laughs> yes. Yes, that's absolutely right. Yes. But anyway, so Tacitus. So um, then the next sort of 
aspect I wanted to ask you about was the architecture. Mm -hmm. Because there are um, relationships with, again, with, um, in, I mean, quite strong relationships with many of your previous interests and images. And uh, how did you feel when you look, you know, first looked at the building thinking you had to do something in it? Well, I mean, I was lucky in that moment because I immediately thought I had to make a portrait film and I had to do it through turning a lens 90 degrees because I, I work with anamorphic on 16 mil um, and so I know that I've turned lenses around and watched films go portrait. And I suddenly at that moment, I mean, I literally just in that instant, I thought, anamorphic portrait film, why doesn't anyone do this? Yeah, it's amazing. And, um, but then, of course, I had a journey in trying to find out if how possible it was and, and technically. Um, what, what, you know, because it wasn't completely simple. Some lenses just lost a lot of focus left and right. But that's what, so because I had that revelation, I didn't, you know, uh, that's, I carried the portrait with me for many, many months without knowing a portrait of what. And um, at a certain point, you know, very late in the day, I turned, um, I, I, I have a um, postcard, second-hand postcard, flea market postcard collection, and I, turned, I took out all my portrait format postcards mm. and I put them on the wall and it was fountains, it was steps, mm. it was, um, and the th you know, the things that appear in the film in yes. a way. Mm. And um, it, that made me begin to think about the portrait because I'd, I had been stuck on, you know, landscape. You, you just, cinema is landscape. It's amazing how strong that is, even in your unconscious. And so to just turn it on its side and to get myself away from that, so you know, so that was the beginning, and and then um, I, in, I, I remember the moment when I was, because I also did all these other things which I've never done before, which I had to do entirely um, blindly, and uh, you know, I booked, uh, I just knew that this had to be about artifice. I somehow thought the natural world will not work in there, and. Um, so I booked a, a film studio in Berlin, and I kept going down the beautiful film studio, Havel Studios, by a lake, and I kept going down. The guy was very nice, Jonathan, and I kept on saying, I don't know what I'm doing. Do you mind if I just come and have a look? You know, and there were people making adverts down there and stuff like that. And I knew that, I, so I had this idea that I had a film studio, but I still didn't know what I was doing. This went on for a very, 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 very long time. <laughs> And then at a certain point, I, was l I remember lying on my bed, actually forcing myself to think, so it hurt my head. And I remember thinking, why have I booked a film studio, you know, in a sort of panic that I had for four months? And um, why don't I just film it in the turbine hole? And then I thought, why don't, of course I have to make the illusion of the turbine, I have to create the turbine hole inside the studio. And th that was a moment when... Um, I, you know, I rang up Steve White and, you know, and it was, in, you know, just in the way it always is with me, it was the only day the turbine hall was free from anything else and, and so he took this photograph for me and then as soon as I had this photograph, um, it was that back wall mm. and um, mm. I started sort of cutting it and I had the, the other thing I had was once I worked out that I was going to use this portrait format and I had to use the ARRI uh, 235 aperture gate and it was very particular the proportions of it so I knew that my the proportion of my image was going to be 1 to 1.73 recurring so everything I could cut everything out to 1.173 recurring so I mean I started to carry a calculator around with me which is not my style and I just uh, you know and I saw so all the portrait you know the postcards I started to make them 1.13 and I suddenly had my format and at a certain point I was I actually resolved this just by doing collage. I was sitting looking at the turbine hall and then I had a strip of film and I cut that out to be the right proportions and then I stuck sprockets yes. on the turbine hall mm. and Mount Analog of course. Yes. And well, then I and then we, um, we and then I yeah. I called upon my friends. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. So we should talk about that. Yes. Do you want to yes. ask a bit more yeah, about yes. like I mean, I was <coughs> reading the text and trying to reconstruct, in a sense, what it was that you meant by analogue in general, in some sense, not mm -hmm. just restricted uh, to film. And I think it was quite interesting, but on the one hand, it seems to be intrinsically kind of related to drawing in some sense, I mean, in a very kind of open-ended mm -hmm. uh, 
not necessarily a purely conventional sense of drawing, but in respect to a medium or a material which is vulnerable in some sense. I mean, because in a way, the, the scratching, the, the whatever um, that might occur within kind of film or in, in a range of practices that people might generally think of were analog, there seems something about the vulnerability of the medium or alternatively something kind of invulnerable and forever locked away about the digital. I mean, it's either damaged or secure. I mean, yes. and we talk about it being secure. Mm. And there seems to be something about kind of vulnerability as opposed to security in that distinction. And that is only in relation to the advent of digital. The, the, the word, uh, ad, the, w the way that we think about analog now as being vulnerable. <coughs> I mean, before it was normal. So it's only in relation to digital. Is that what you mean, Mark? Well, before, I think the analogy that was used, with, I mean, analogy and analog are, of course, not exactly the same, but the an analogy that was very often used is one you, I think, refer to in your film, which is the clock. I mean, before the idea that the clock's hand swept round, um, on a clockwork mechanism was an analog of time. I mean, an analog of the turning of the planets and so forth, mm -hmm. of our relationship to day and night. Whereas the digital clock, when very fascinating though it is, when the numbers tick over and suddenly go into a beautiful row of zeros <laughs> at midnight, and you think, my God, time has vanished. <laughs> but um, um, it, you know, it's, it's just code. It's not. There's no. It, there's no attempt, as you, you know, to use your, to draw an image of the, of what is happening in the world. It's, um, it's just enciphered in a different way. Yeah. Well, nothing could turn into a pumpkin at o o o. Exactly. Yes. Yes. The stroke. Of, that's right. Mm. Um, uh, the um, so Mount Analog. Mm -hmm. Yes. The, the René de Mal. Do you do you know it? Do you want to say something? No, no, no. Do you want to say something? Mount Analog is a novel that was written by a, a French surrealist, René de Mal. Um, and there are re references uh, all the way through film um, to this imaginary mountain. The thing about Mount Analog, and it was Dale McFarlane here who texted me, you know, because of course I am digital also, because people think I'm not, texted <laughs> me to say, have I read Mount Analog? And um, just because of the title, of course, mm. it's just such a beautiful title. And I, ha I hadn't. Um, but I, I immediately, you know, got a copy. And um, this was during the period of not knowing, and I carried this book around with me. It's, it's impossible to really explain what it's about, Mount Ananon. No. It's, um, it's about a mountain that you have to believe in the, po in the possibility of it being there, or ne the necessity of. I love that line, actually. It's either... You got it there. Yeah, I've got it. Yeah, yeah. It's a beautiful. There's a beautiful line. You have to believe in the. In, in fact, it's in here. I'll just read. Maybe I read you this because it's a very, very elusive. Yeah. It doesn't actually. He died on ch in chapter five I, from I, TB. I'll show his photo, shall I? Yeah. Do you think? Can we have the pictures up now? In. Uh, there's his picture. Oh my God! What's the antivirus? <laughs> That's very funny. <laughs> 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 but what, gen what generation is that book? That, that's the meant to be the first edition. Is that the first edition? Yes. In, but I think in, but it would be in English, you see, the first American edition, because it should be in French. But that's, but um, you, you carry on. I, I'll say a bit more about him but after you. Yeah, I think it's good if, because you, um, I'm just going to read you the, this quote I'll from the I'll show you a nicer book. picture of him. There's a, that's him dying in Paris in 1944. The, the book is unfinished. It, it finishes in chapter five, mid-sentence. And I'm just going to read you a quote from it. Um, well, I have to read you the paragraph before, which is what I wrote, and then I'll quote from him because it's difficult to explain otherwise. So Mount Analog exists for those who do not doubt the possibility of its existence, but for those others it is an impossibility, a fantasy. It is higher than any mountain as yet known on this earth. Its snowy peak reaching into the sphere of eternity 
but its foothills most necessarily are accessible to humanity. Its scale and proportion mean its circumferences of several thousand kilometers, and it is hidden from normal observation because of the refraction of light and the curvature of space. However, it needs must show itself at a certain point when the sun sits on the horizon at dawn or at dusk, at particular coordinates, and at a certain time of year. Its probable, probable position can be worked out through logic and pure mathematics. And this is what he wrote. This is from the book. To find a way of reaching this I the island, one must assume the possibility and even the necessity of reaching it. The only admissible hypothesis is that the shell of curvature which surrounds the island is not absolutely impenetrable, that is, not always, not everywhere, and not for everyone. At a certain moment and in a certain place, certain persons, those who do not know, th oh no, those who know how and wish to do so, can enter. The privileged moment we're seeking must be determined by a standard unit of time common to Mount Analog and to the rest of the world, therefore by a natural timepiece, very probably the course of the sun. And um, the point about this book is that I, I, I just carried it around with me for many, many months. And um, there's this beautiful moment at the book where it says, on the 10th of the following October, we embar em embarked upon the impossible, yeah. <coughs> which was just because the opening yesterday was the 10th of yes. October. Yes. And I was, in fact, embarking upon <laughs> the impossible. <laughs> so, um, and only, you know, in retrospect, when I'm writing that later, did I see the sort of parallel between you know, the threat film is under a an analogue and, and the fact that it's becoming this realm that those who believe the necessity to do so will have to try and get there again to try and climb Mount Analogue. But it, it's become that point. So it somehow it became a very, very beautiful, if kind of very difficult to pin down, mm. analogy, to use the word, for the whole project. So yes. it, the Mount Analogue actually itself does sort of yes, appear. Yes, it does appear, and the, and the, and the, 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 the mist... It's yeah. showing how high it is. It is sort of above the clouds. I mean, that, that yeah. I felt that that was... That, well, no, that yes. is it. That was the But, uh, but I, I'm probably kind of <coughs> over, over, over um, theori theori you know, responding too theoretically, but I, I, I don't, again, don't want to use too many words, but I actually thought that there were resonances of the imagery in the book that gave... <coughs> and this is kind of, in a way, you know, this is treacherous territory, but uh, that gave it a kind of alchemical feel to me, your film. I mean, not only did we have these insubstantial um, um, textures and, and emanations, like the bubbles, and is it, a, is it the yolk of an egg that falls through the... No, it's a bubble of dry ice, actually. Is it? The, the, that beautiful sort of yeah. shape, this sort of slow shape? That in falls slow in motion. That, flows into, that's, that falls into the, into the it's cloud. A it's a bubble, but f right. distorted by being filled with dry ice. I see. Well, it has, to me, I thought it had, because of you'd had the big uh, ostrich egg, or mm -hmm. uh, that, that there was this sort of egg-like, sim some symbolism of that kind going through. And of course, um, Domar was a follower of Gurdjieff, um, so there's a, there's a kind of <coughs> metaphysical um, aspect to his book that picks up on modernism's interest in the metaphysical. It comes through in Mondrian, who you also have, you know, kind of, you know, you refer, refer to Mondrian, the same consciousness of the, where geometry and the realm of the numinous, you know, opens up onto the realm of the numinous. And he calls, mm -hmm. the subtitle refers to that too, doesn't it? You've got a tale of non-Euclidean yeah, yeah, and yeah. symbolic, non-Euclidean, um, the non-Euclidean quest. Mountain climbing. Mm. Yes, yes. <laughs> Mountain climbing, yes. Mm. So, I actually, I had a few pictures. Um, um, to sh that of some of the things you've already mentioned. I do, should I show them? Yes. Yes. So, and then we'll have questions, shall we? So there's um, that's that's Ballet Mécanique, um, the uh, Fernand Léger film um, of 1924. And really, you know, Tacita, though um, not, I think, consciously kind of remembering these experimental films as such, is very much in tune with all these. Um, Direct the direct action into the, onto the film. And there you have p half sprocket holes, but that's <coughs> probably because he's filmed, he's photographed the actual film rather than put doing it in the camera. Then we've got Doma. Oh, that's quite good of Doma. <laughs> that's his last book of collected, uh, well, the last book in English of his collected essays after his death. And then here is um, I thought that because it, because I thought there was 
you know, quite a reminiscences of Berlin. And I wondered if, because this is Lottie Reiniger working in Berlin um, with her one, her one kind of, her, she called it her trick table. This is, she's sort of like a sewing, that's her, like a sewing machine. That was her, that was the camera, the Rostrum camera, working on her, making films, you know, on her own, making big, big films on her own at this trick table. Did you, did you have her in mind at all? Do you know her work? I know her work, yeah. but I, I didn't, but, you know, consciously. I feel you're, her, her, you're inheriting her. But uh, the work is imbued with Berlin. I mean, yes. it's all filmed in Berlin. Yes. Mm. Mm. That's the film she made, of course, totally different from your kind of, uh, your kind of aesthetic. Um, but then this is um, the, the Polish, the two Polish um, artists, uh, Stefan and Francisca Tomasin, who worked here in London after they were refugees. Lost, this is one of their films, and you see some of the same kind of interventions using film as film. And that's called Particles, one of their films. Very beautiful. I think that's from the 50s. Seven, oh, that's really late. Particles in Space, 79. Then that's Thomason working in his particular camera. I feel like you is a kind of... <laughs> Um, you know, the, the idea that a film can open up from a box, that whole world can just be made. The point about this is that, which was what I had to deal with the press corps yesterday, and um, was, you know, why can't this be digital? And that, which was, of course, the question they wanted to ask. And, what, uh, you know, the point about it is that it was through n my need to invent with film and not use any post-production to invent for this medium is that, you know, the invention is the answer to that. Mm -hmm. Because this film would never have been made on digital because you wouldn't need those constraints. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I um, mean, yes. because I had to... But it's the handmade, isn't it, too? It's I mean, the handmade, yeah, It's the yeah, physically, yeah. the physical... Exactly. I mean, what you described at the very beginning, the concentration, the... Yeah. Almost akin to weaving or sewing. No, but that's what, it, you know, the, um, especially with the... Um, oh, God, sorry, I just trod on the mic. Um, <laughs> this one. <laughs> your enemy. Um, the point about, you know, what happened to me, I had a disastrous moment. In fact, it feels like, you know, it happened five years ago, but it was last weekend um, when the, n the negative cutter made a terrible mistake because she'd forgotten the skills of cope cutting on a, a scope film. And, and um, I had to go back and recut my film. Um, because you lose a frame before and a frame after when it was through an egg cut and, and they were all damaged. So I had to recut the film in this incredibly intense moment with, you know, a one week before the Terrible. opening of the, turn of the, the turbine hall. Yeah. And uh, that was when it felt really like, oh my God, this is just me and it. There's, there's you know, and I think this is probably the most homemade turbine hall installation they've had. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> you know, usually it's, you know huge companies and scissor lifts and stuff like that. But it was just me and, you know, cutting this, you know, in this way. Mm. And um, that's exactly what it felt like, actually. I, I did feel a bit like that. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> so. so we can, yeah, that's it. Yeah. OK. Um, can we take yeah, questions from the floor? There's a, an extra, the, this, you can take my microphone. rather ugly. How do we get rid of that? How do we go dark? How do we go, how do we go dark? Can we go dark? Thank you. We'll see because we, we're, running out of, we're running out of time. So I think okay. we... Okay, thank you. Okay, sorry. Does anyone have a question? Just here, yes. I think you need a mic. Yeah. One thing sprung to mind when I saw the film last night. Um, you were imposing squares and triangles and circles over the back wall of the Tate Modern. And I suddenly thought of Gordon Matter Clark. I wonder if that was in your head at all. I mean, he wasn't consciously in my head, but of course, maybe unconsciously. I mean, he's obviously someone who's even worked digitally, uh, sorry, vertically. Um, 
But yes, of course. And the thing is about those particular, especially the, the, the triangles, which have, you know, which have the turbine hall tr in there. They're so like collage. They're so like collage, you know, which of course is, but it's still film. And, and they, yes, definitely remind me in retrospect of, of him, for sure. I mean, it wasn't consciously, but I didn't let many people into my head in the last few yeah. months. Yes, there's a question here. Ah, sorry. Dorothy. You said there, Tabitha, um, that it had to be more to do with artifice that nature wouldn't have held in the hall. Did I miss you? No, no, <coughs> you were right. No, I just, you know, when I was thinking about what I had to do, I thought about my other films. I actually thought which one of my films could have survived in that space. And um, there's something very artificial about the Turbine Hall. It's, it's, it's like it's... It's not a real place, and I just for some, I mean, I bought the real life in, inside the artifice, but um, I really did I th really thought it had to be something constructed and that I couldn't have, you know, one of my protagonists limping through the frame. <laughs> I just felt that so strongly. I mean, I really had to work intuitively. I had to sort of, you know, believe that it had to be about artifice. I had to make, you know, do all these practical things, like, you know, hiring studios in the belief that w my decisions will make sense to me later. So, um, yeah, it's one of those things, you know, the trusting process of being an artist, it, which is a terrifying one too, of course. So, yes, no, I mean, and then, but of course, film is so beautiful at catching movement. So I didn't want to make it just purely s mm. static in the end. So that's why <coughs> these, these, you know, bits of real life come in through windows and through, you know, the bottom corner and through the three frame motif and mm. and also things like you know for example the waterfall film you can actually film backwards you cannot do this digitally you can do it later but it's still one of the things you can do with film so um, I, it was just like celebrating you know the, the stuff of film and what's possible still with film and it was in a way once I sort of resolved the technique of masking and <coughs> And playing with glass map painting, you know, these old techniques, and, you know, which is how I did the mountain and the lightning, you know, it's all done through the, you know, and I painted the lightning on glass and then we did it through a two way mirror. It was all. Um, so, and, the, and yeah, and the, and the mountain was a blackboard drawing, in fact, mm -hmm. that I did myself under great duress in the corner of the studio. Um, so it was, you know, it's nice to find, you know, re go back to the origins of film and reinvent them. But of course it was all, I wouldn't know what I was going to get. And in the end, of course, I was very blessed and I had a great crew who really got into it, which was very important. So. Um, in, in, in mourning yeah, the passing of uh, <coughs> analog filming, I suppose there's two devices involved. One is the, the camera obscura and the other, you could call it camera lucida, the, the projector. Um, and I wondered of those two boxes, those two rooms, and gadgets, devices, which, which of the two, or of, of the two, uh, which are you, in a sense, missing the most? And is it also that between those two, you've found ways of working physically in <coughs> ways that are a bit like uh, extensions to, the, to to those to the body of those two rooms, uh, which are very very physical. Um, and uh, I mean, uh, do, 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 do you do you miss the the passing of the movie camera or the mass of the passing of the movie projector as much? Um, well, I'm. It's not over yet. <laughs> just to, just nearly there, but not quite. Um, I. You know what I will miss? <coughs> I, 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 will miss f I will miss film stock, which passes through both camera and projector. I will miss the stuff. Um, negative film, they say, will probably go on for a lot longer than the print, the positive. And um, negative is, is still a very, very beautiful, as they say, capture medium. <laughs> But nobody prints anymore because nobody needs to have the physical encounter with the object except for artists. 
and the odd filmmaker who's you know very you know tyrannical about having their work projected but most people you know that you know they get their work put into another format almost immediately you know photographers most of them get put into magazines books um, you know billboards television everything gets mediated but the only place left where we have to have the physical encounter um, is in the museum and the gallery and just nearly the cinema. So um, that's what I will miss. I will miss print because print is what we are losing very soon. Negative might go on a bit more but print and by print we will miss the, we will lose the projector before the camera. So. Any other questions? Uh, okay. Okay. Um, I think then uh, we should end. I'd like to thank Marina very much and Tacita very much for coming. And now it feels it's way past everyone's bedtime. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you.